I can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted. I just want to start off by saying, Tammy, that I spent the last few minutes trying to get the lighting. I changed it from color to color, and I changed it brighter and darker, and I can't get myself to look any better. I've just decided that's reality. That's as good as it's going to get for today. So, and I had my eye surgery, but I still need readers for the little tiny print. So here you go. Apparently, we're aging. This is what happened. And one more thing, since you brought that up, did you hear about? I don't know. The, I'm not pushing any brands. Did you hear about these eye drops that? give you I the did. ability to see wow yes, I thought but that i don't was know if cool. they would be in compliance with what my eye doctor is and i'm doing amazing with my eyes so i'm just gonna do whatever the doctor says so but we have we're, we're tardy so we're gonna get oh, started we have to so. work okay i'm ready so to you should be able to see them in the open try try that but uh the first one should be following my ftd formal therapeutic disclosure can you see that one or do i need to move it to answered oh i think well i can see it so that's okay, good. To then we're going to just stay in that one. Following my formal therapeutic disclosure 10 days ago, my wife demands divorce. I do respect her decision, but she is now pressuring me to tell my 42 year old son and all three siblings, all the details of my addictions. She doesn't want to cover up for me anymore as she did the last 12 months. I struggle immensely with, with the all my advice on it or any advice on how to deliver the news to my sons and siblings. Thank you. Um, sorry, I had a little technical glitch here. Um, well, first of all, I don't, if you're not going to be together, then your wife or, or the person you're getting ready to divorce really can't demand anything. Um, they might want you to do something or request, they were, you know, like tell your son, but you know, if she's going to do that, she's going to go do that. But pressuring you to tell your son and your all. other siblings and it's like um, all the details like they get right, all, all the, the details. details which is and so terrific. so thanks to <laughs> so you, you oh yeah. um so the other thing is you know a, a number of things it, it it's none of my business about your sex life you know if you're my if i'm your dad if you're my dad the last thing i want to know especially as you're looking a little bit like, more like grandpa is to find out what kind of sex you had when i was younger or whatever you're doing now and i say to you you folks out there every single week i will say it forever don't tell your children they don't need to know about your sex life unless they saw it or pulled into it in some icky way they walked by this or they found that but if they don't need to be pulled in you know we had problems where you're feeling challenged so i would just you know i i would record this for your wife or ask her to come here because i can say with some authority that if she did, will she can pressure you or not she can tell them or not but it will hurt your children like that that's what you know she can feel like i'm going to prove to them that he's the bad one you know which i completely understand but i mean i know that feeling but she's going to hurt your children and more than she hurts you you know, so, um, yeah, and I, I, my advice on delivering it is don't, <laughs> um, Tammy and yeah, you two need to see a therapist. I, I, well, and it, it, you work on you, you've got no control over her. You can make this worse, you know, by relapsing and doing everything. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm so, first of all, I am terribly sorry that she is so, uh, traumatized and that, you know, that, it, you know, it's coming to an end, even after formal therapeutic disclosure, it, it is absolutely a partner's choice. So, so we're going to set that aside for her to traumatize your son and your siblings. You know, it's uh, again, I don't want to know my siblings sex life. I, I just don't. So, so, um, so for her to be in so much pain that she perceives that it's okay to run around and hurt other people to try to hurt you, is my perception, and I know I'm just reading this in a little note, but that's that's terribly sad. I suspect this will happen. So you having a planned response of I'm, you know, I'm so sorry that you know that you you've heard these things. Yes, I really struggled. You know, I'm on my personal journey. I'm doing the best I can. You know, addiction is brokenness, and um, and owning our brokenness is how we can, you know, start to heal and and make repairs. I, I want to reiterate the worst thing to me would be that you go and relapse. So, so please don't, I know this is a painful, hurtful thing. Please don't go, Oh, screw it. Um, I'm going to just go off there. So you work on you, 
have integrity. We're seeking integrity. We have a treatment program, seeking integrity. I value integrity. I, I encourage you to lean into your integrity, do what you need to do, lean into your recovery community um, so that you don't make things worse. And there's going to be fallout. You, you know, you can see that train coming. I'm really sorry. Well, I am too. I, I think that, you know, and I highly recommend to any couple who's in the process of separation that you, you know, you get a mediator, you get some kind of, you know, a lot a couples therapist you're gonna to have to deal with their kids or your grandkids or your finances and you don't have to do it while you're pointing fingers at each other and say i'm going to tell on you you know it's not going to be helpful for the separation process so you know right tammy tammy knows lots and lots of therapists who are you have it's a certain skill to work with couples that are separating um to keep the peace and to help you do it so if you and even if you go to therapy yourself for this i don't mean to push therapy but this is a very complicated situation and it isn't about facts it's about feelings it isn't about what she says or what your kids know or it's there's a feeling under there like i hate him or he ruined my life or you know whatever it is but she's acting this out and you know you're going to tell everyone and you're going to you know that's kind of like wanting to punish you so if you can get some support for yourself or both of you um, I would really encourage that. And Dr. Rob typed into to me, um, so I'm going to tell you. Even if I you are, I typed everyone. Ed, it said to no, the hosts and said everybody, to the hosts and panelists, which is you and me. You have to hit everyone. Oh. It's okay. So I'm going to read it to you. It says, even if you are an addict and have hurt people you love, you still get to have your own boundaries. And thank you for saying that. Gavin um, Sharp did a webinar December 3rd. I remember that one. So it's in our previously recorded webinars on this. And it talks about not just why addicts have to have boundaries. That's what it was about. But it was it was about why everybody needs to have boundaries. He like, and, and he did just a beautiful job. So Gavin Sharp's on December 3rd on the previously recorded webinars on on this channel so yeah and remember that this is free i mean podcasts are free these discussions are free their groups are free um not everybody can afford uh some of the online groups not everyone can afford therapy but um this we can do for you yes so well, go and, for it tammy you know and speaking of you know, the online we have work groups and you know what was driving the bus on the 42 years of you know of that you know, inner child work group starts tomorrow with Eddie Caparucci. We have attachment wounds groups that, you know, are starting again in April. Those are help us work on the issues that are underneath. So if you stop the behavior, you know, that's a place to start on, on working on some of the underneath stuff. Okay. And I would also just add to that, since we're talking about our work groups, that if you want to show your wife or your husband that you're actually working on this and not just reading and pretending to read a book, they have to show up every Thursday for an hour and a half and go to this class, you know. So uh, we are we're full. We're quite busy. But I try to think of the things that really keep people, you know, the podcast keep people sober. They're at no charge. You know, sometimes I've heard people that are on their way to the acting out place and they had the podcast on. Yes. Darn it. Dr. Weiss ruined this for me. Yes. You know? And anyway, I forget we should to. answer questions. Well, but I, just to, um, he used Thursday as an example. They are all different days and times. So go look at the online work groups and check out. There's a betrayed partner one starting in April too. So check them out. Okay. Next question. Do you recommend a celibacy period for couples in recovery for multiple affairs? 30, 60, 90 a days, I'm assuming. Any concerns for the betrayed partner's recovery if they are having sex? Wow. There's like a lot there. Yes. Um, so I'll just unpack it, Tammy, and maybe Please. you can pick the parts that... So multiple affairs i don't know whether that's one of them or both of them um you know who had the affairs um part of my question is how long has it been you know how long has it been since you started this whole process um if it's been two months or three months it's i'm not sure i would feel comfortable having sex you will hear me say you know until i'm stopped doing this um why would you have sex with someone you don't trust and you would probably say, oh, I'd never have sex with someone I don't trust. Well, you don't trust your spouse. And so until you are in a place of trust, that's, I think, and really more than, look, for some people, it'd be, it'd be 30 days, they need to just have some space. For some people, they need six months to learn how to, how to make love, how to hold each other's hand, how to look in the mirror, how to, you know, how to be intimate. So it isn't really about, in my opinion, like this many days. 
Um, it's really about, um, do I trust this person? Has it been long enough since this happened? Um, do I feel like I want to move toward them? Um, one of the challenges I think that, that I've seen with spouses is that you want to have sex with us. <laughs> you know, you find out what we've done and what's gone, and you're like, okay, now a, a couple of things happen. Number one, sometimes a spouse will feel, okay, now I know everything. Now, at least I know who a little bit more how you are and I feel safer because I know what's been happening and I, don't, I'm, I wasn't crazy. And so I want to have sex with you. <laughs> I have seen that. Um, I have seen spouses who said, I want to have sex with you morning and night because in their heads, they're thinking maybe that will keep you from going out there. So here's another question. What is your motivation? Um, you know, what is your mo motivation for being sexual? Is it to make the, your is it make your partner happy? Is it to make you happy? Is it because you think it's the right thing to do? I mean, these aren't reasons to have sex. So I will say this, there is a whole process that I really, and, and your question speaks perfectly to it, which is what is sex? Because a lot of people think, you know, intercourse or oral, and I think, you know, there's a whole process of building that. And at, for addicts, we're really used to going from zero to 100. And we miss all of the pieces in between. And so what I would want you to also do is, you know, this week we're going to uh, do massages with clothes on and we're going to hold each other's hands. And that week we're going to do something together that we both enjoy, you know, like that you begin to rediscover or discover all the pieces that bring you together. And all of that leads you to intimacy and sex. But it feels a little bit like, even with your question, it's like, okay, when should we start having sex? And it's like, you know, I think that's, there's so many pieces within that, that, um, that's, that's, it's, as you saw, it's like five questions. So Tammy, I know you have stuff to add. Or well, you and I do, um, in that, like, when can we start having sex or am I negatively affecting my partner's cell, uh, uh, progress if we're having sex? And to your point, it's like, if, if I hear this often, so I'm using male and female just for, you know, if she goes, he is a porn addict. And so he's in fantasy all the time. So if he's having physical intercourse with you, is he really intimate with you? Or is he still in his head fantasizing about other things? So a little bit of it is just what Dr. Rob is talking about is, are you connecting in real and meaningful ways outside of sexual intercourse, you know, so that, so that there is that connection, that this is a person that you trust, and you're not going, I wonder if he's off thinking about, you know, all that porn he was watching while he was watching porn, you know, now that he stopped, um, one other piece of this, you said, you know, it's, can you affect, um, his recovery? Every addict chooses, you know, on a daily basis, hourly basis, you know, what we're going to do for our recovery. So, so you can't make him have a relapse. You can't make him have an affair. You can't keep him from having an affair. You know, you can do things that are more connected for the two of you, or you can hold healthy boundaries. You can do things, but you can't you know, like what you do or don't do isn't the reason he has an affair. So that's my other thought on that. Ready for the next one? Or go did you have go ahead. Okay. Wait, I okay. do have to ask you, how come you look so good on this and I look so bad? Like, did you do something magical that I know? Oh, maybe it's that like silly button about make yourself look better. Anyway, go ahead. I anyway. can handle this. My narcissism is, you know. We're a little vain, but we're here for you. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> we're my imperfect husband, and we're worthwhile. Yeah. My husband okay. is a sex addict. He had a bad experience um, using the 12 steps with a coach a few years ago and won't go to 12 step meetings now. He has a qualified therapist and, and attends a therapist run group and another support group. What are the chances of recovery if he doesn't go to 12 steps? Hmm. I'm going to maybe guess about the word coach. I'm going to think sponsor, maybe. Oh, because um, I, mean, I was like, I don't even know what a coach would do with 12 well, steps. Well, a coach so is someone you. you pay, you know, like, yeah. you know, it's almost like a tutor, you know. Yeah. But, you know, how can I teach you to work on? How can we, I encourage you? How can we meet regular accountability? But it isn't a relationship necessarily. I mean, coaches are not necessarily, yeah. coaches are not your sponsor. Right. Um, but if I didn't understand 12 step, I would think, oh, maybe, you know, coach means sponsor. So I'm okay. going to, um, uh, if he's working with a coach, that's not the right person to do that work with. And I can imagine right. that didn't work out well. If he had a bad experience with us, with a sponsor, um, 
You know, I think part of what we have to work on uh, as, as addicts is being able to accept not getting things that we want or not feeling good about every experience and not being black and white about it. So I didn't like that. Here's a good example. Um, they say that we have to go to a whole bunch of meetings before we pick one. Oh, he was paying a coach. Well, that's easier. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I can understand someone wanting to coach you with the whole with educating you about addiction or they want to coach you um, in how to put your life together after recovery or as a part of her. In other words, I people do coach people about how to put their life together after addiction. And that, of course, is really helpful if you've got the right coach. But teaching people about the 12 steps, about working the program about being a part of it that's something that people do for free as a gift to themselves and i would never want someone paying a coach to take him through the 12 steps okay that said we are always looking for a reason to not take responsibility for you know and i can tell you every single person i say man that i've sent to a 12-step meeting and they were never at one this is what happens they come back after i advised and i advised them go to a meeting and they went to a meeting and they come back to therapy the next week and they say oh my god i can't go back to that meeting because i don't i'm not like that person and they pick the absolute most troubled most vulnerable person you know who you would not want to be and or doing things you would not want to do and they say well i'm not like them so i don't need to be there and who would want to be around those horrible people anyway because when you're scared and when you feel um worried about how people are going to perceive you it's easy to put it down and run um so what we tell people to do in the 12-step programs is to find someone who is like you with similar problems and pick them as a sponsor but anyway you don't drop out of the whole thing just because you had a bad experience your spouse needs to in recovery is about tolerating uncomfortable circumstances being flexible about finding answers working with people even when it gets difficult i mean everything he ran away from is going to have is it's like having a coach. The 12 steps is like having a coach, only you get a, you get the small, you get the coach for free. So, um, but this kind of like stubbornness, unwillingness, I don't want to go to another group. It's nice to have a therapist. Well, Tammy, why don't you answer the question? Because I, I don't think everyone has to go to 12 step to recover, but uh, I think we have a thought about this. I know how to answer this question. I, go I, ahead. I, well, I do. I, I, you know, so in 12 step, there's the promises and the promises come true if you work the steps, you know, and the things that you get in recovery by working the steps are really amazing and such freedom from. So I think my first question was, you know, and I see he's in a work group and that's great. That's just, but again, that's once a week. And so, so I feel like he's, you know, cherry picking. Well, I, I like, kind of like this and I'll be willing to do that. And is he really changing? Because you, you said he had a bad experience a few years ago. Are you seeing significant changes, you know, with him doing what he's doing? If it's really working, you will know. I mean, and he, you will see him being more empathetic. You will see him, you know, being um, engaging in different ways. You know, the vulnerability that we just talked about in the question before, you will see that. If he's not, he's missing out. He is still holding on to old behaviors, which is what we talk about in 12 steps. And here's another thing. There's a whole bunch of different 12 steps. And even within the different kinds of 12 steps, you know, there's different meetings. When I moved out of state from my little home group, I had to pick a new home group. I shopped. I went to different meetings and I went, this is a nice meeting. These are nice people, but this is not my home group. And then I walked into a meeting and then I found my peeps and this is the group that I went with. And then things changed and my schedule changed and I had to go, I had to do it again. And I did. And, you know, it isn't like, oh, I went to one kind of meeting and that was bad. I had to be willing. And honestly, I guess that's what it really comes down to. In the 12 step, we talk about we have to be willing. If you want what you will, if you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, these are the steps we took. You know, it's a suggested program of recovery. Are there other ways to do it? Sure. I hear all the time of people white knuckling it and they're miserable or, you know, they're abstinent, but they aren't, you know, they aren't really changing. They aren't getting the joy that, you know, true recovery brings. So everybody gets to choose, you know, if it's working for the two of you, fantastic. If it's not, there's opportunities. How's that? Well, all I know is I fixed the lighting and I feel so much better about that. 
It's um, not so, about you and the lighting. It's oh, I yeah, but you're just saying I have to like motivate myself. If I look over there and I'm like, oh my God, I wouldn't even want to talk to that guy. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, therapy groups end. You know, I went to therapy group for two and a half years. It was really great. I've conducted therapy groups where people have spent long periods of time, but they end. And since addiction is a lifelong problem, more like diabetes, you're going to say, well, I'm going to go to the diabetes clinic and I'm going to get in. So I'm going to do this for about three years and then I won't need to anymore. No, you have a chronic condition. So I think the 12 step piece is 20 years from now, you can go and say, I'm still struggling and they'll know exactly what it means and exactly where you are. I don't have to look for the right therapist, the right group, you know, because I've got this place. And so part of it is, I think, and I, I don't think, Therapists who don't understand addiction don't get this. You know, like, well, we're not sure the 12 steps works for everyone. It may not, but it's an environment where you can go for the rest of your life for free and people will encourage you and support you and be there for you and take your phone calls and help you through the day. And I think, well, you know, who gets that for free? It makes me want to be an addict. Who else gets that? Um, but uh, I did, I was going to say one more thing. I wrote it down. Um, oh, therapy group is not real. Like you have a therapist who's, who's keeping it a safe place and keeping people from get, arguing and disagreeing. It's arbitrary. You go in the group and those people are already there and there's someone to help build the relationships. What I want people to do is go to meetings and not know anybody and have to deal with asking for help. And I, I don't know how to talk to anyone or, or raise your hand and say, I hate being here, but I'm here because my therapist told me to, but you at least stay, you know? So I do think, again, therapy has a different purpose and it, it may even get to the same result, like you stop acting out, but one is a more lifelong, how do I live my life over time and where can I go whenever I needed to get support? And one is a more short-term self-growth, learn how to live life better. They're just different things. And I've been in recovery a while. I still go to 12 step meetings. I still get something out of it. Thank and goodness. I have something, I still have something to give to other people too. It's not just about me, 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 me taking, you know, I can be there and share my experience, strength and hope. I, I not only, you know, warm a seat in the meetings, I have done the steps. I continue to work on the steps. I want the, you know, the amazing things that recovery brings and I'm not willing to backslide, which is what happens if I'm, you know, if I'm not taking care of my recovery. So I think we've probably covered that one. We could talk, I could talk about 12 step all the time. I'm already so, taking I'm notes on the next one. Okay. So you go ahead. How can you work on your core beliefs that go along with being a sex addict? For example, feeling your only worth value is in sex is sex due to years of sexual abuse. I'm in 12 step and intensive outpatient therapy. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just writing my notes about this. Um, so I don't know. Um, so I'm gonna assume that you're the sex addict. It's just easier for me to- I'm assuming that to too, yeah, yeah. So number one thing is you gotta stop acting out. If you are not sober from the behavior, then you don't know whether you're dealing with the shame of the past or the shame of saying the wrong thing to somebody and really feeling bad about it or the shame of your acting out because you're going to feel bad all the time. Um, so number one, you gotta, you got, you have to be sober and you have to be, be engaged with other people who are sober so that you can be given to build a new life. Um, so I wrote the list, uh, you have to be sober. It's really important to build non-sexual friendships, you know, uh, especially if you're a man with other men to, you know, you say, well, you know, uh, where is it right there? Uh, my only value is sex. Well, build some relationships that have nothing to do with sex. Go to a climbing club, join a choir, you know, find a place to go, not just, not just recovery, but where you can enjoy yourself and make non-sexual. I used to sing in a choir and we would go like on the weekends and we'd play canasta. I mean, it wasn't like we, you know, um, we had movie nights, but it, you know, it was, and I think making yourself comfortable in social settings without understanding that they're not going to turn that way and it's not going to be, and they're not going to see you as a, for your sexual self in that way. I think just, I'm big on lived experience. And, you know, it's funny as a therapist, you think, you know, I do think that we, we are really helpful in kind of straightening you guys out, pointing in the right direction or looking at how you get stuck and kind of getting you unstuck and pushing you back out there. But, um, but your world is going to come together out there. So what I mean is um, 
fun. That was the next one. Was, Harry, when was the last time you had any fun? Now you're going to say or think, oh, he just wants to distract me from my pain. He doesn't really want to deal with it. And I actually do want to distract you from your pain because um, sometimes that can become the focus of our obsession as we've lost uh, the obsession of addiction. We just move to hating ourselves and obsessing about ourselves. And, and that could be an underlying issue like depression or anxiety or OCD or something. And that's something else, by the way, I'm going to go around and around. Just because you've had trauma doesn't mean you don't have psychiatric issues. You know, a lot of people say, I'm going to explore my trauma and work on my problem. I'm going to, but they actually have depression also, or they just, you know, not everything's going to be solved by doing trauma work. Um, okay. Sorry. I have another couple of things I wanted to say. I'm crossing off my list. Um, what do you do for other people? Um, I think one of the cures for self-obsession is, you know, what does this other si situation require of me? Because it could be volunteering. It could be, you know, uh, really, if you're at the beginning, get a dog. Just being home on time and having to take care of it and, you know, all the way to, you know, giving of your time or yourself. But service, you can't do anything but feel good about yourself when you've given something away of yourself. Um, you know, I'm really looking to do some... Um, some cash, giving some cash away to, there's a lot of people in crisis right now in the world. And I was thinking how grateful I am to be able to send some charity money to people who really need it. Um, so uh, that makes me feel good about myself in a very simple way. And um, there is one more thing, which is, you know, if you have a lot of abuse, um, the way I look at it is, um, we have to realize that our lives aren't necessarily going to be like everyone else's and we may live in pain. And, you know, it's kind of like if you had a back injury as a child, you may still live in that pain, even though you've exercised, it's better. You've had surgeries, but it's not going to be like the person who didn't have the injury and you will have to live with the results of that all of your life. So part of what I, uh, if you're looking for a cure, if you're looking for a magic wand, if you're looking to fix it, there is no it that you're going to fix you can become more and more functional and move further and further away from what happened and learn to really look at it, not have it affect you, but it's not going to, you can't go back and be seven again. You can't go back and be three again. However you developed, you know, I still live working around pain. I know I do. And in fear uh, a lot of the time. Um, but I, anyway, so um, Tammy, can you drop into that? Because I ran out of things to say. Well, no, but you, and you covered a lot. I, I really do think leaning into what's in your outer circle and hopefully there's fun things. I remember in treatment when uh, my therapist said, if you don't make recovery fun, you're not going to make it. And I took it to heart and like the, you know, I found a group and we, we went, I lived in Michigan. We went cross country skiing and we went bowling and we went, you know, roller skating. We did stuff together, you know, and had fun together in, you know, in, in various ways. I uh, like Dr. Rob, I believe in service work and, and I have my ways of doing service work that is and it isn't all about just doing recovery stuff. I mean, I can do my things at meetings or whatever, but I do other things like he's talking about giving, you know, on a financial level to, I, I, I do my things that are meaningful to me. So I, you know, I take care of my program. I, yeah, and I do think, yeah, you, you will always have that shadow of, of, you know, of the pain, but it, 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 it really can lessen. You are not right. your sexual abuse. You do not have it happened. It absolutely happened. But to let that that happened to you color in a negative way, the rest of your life, you know, I, I you know, I really want um, people to Don't feel let empowered. It define you. Exactly. I want saying. them to be empowered to go. I own that this happened, but I'm going right. to take steps to be able to, to move forward. So, um, so, go, so glad you're here. Seriously consider both um, the inner child that may be helpful but also the the betrayal or the attachment wounds one because you know the the neglect abandonment abuse all of those things you know those those work groups um on seeking integrity may be really useful too i i guess i wanted to add one thing which is okay um I saw the words intensive therapy, you know, and sometimes uh, especially if you had a lot of abuse, it needs to go slower. You know, sometimes it's just I'm overwhelmed and I start um, going back to some what I used to do, like like making it my fault or, you know, so I, I really think one of the most important things for people who have had sexual abuse 
to be able to do is to say, I need to slow down, or I don't want to do that right now, or can we go a little, in other words, it may be that about, you need to be able to set a boundary uh, by saying to your therapist, could we move away from this for a couple of weeks, if that's really what you feel you need to do. Um, so uh, I just wanted to add, sometimes intensive therapy isn't, you know, your best bet, not consistently. And it's easy to fall into a shame spiral and mm -hmm. the, the, the shame there is when you're abused sexually, you didn't do anything to warrant that. So the shame, you know, I mean, it's just so hard and painful for me to see that people are feeling that shame so deeply and, mm. you know, and, and they, it, it, it isn't their fault. Nothing they did or didn't do, you know, caused it. So, okay. Next question. My partner's recovery, oh, this goes to one that was a couple of times ago. My partner's recovery and self-discovery is very helpful to my healing. I am worried that I'm too dependent on his input to help me when he's already abandoned me in times of need. Do I need to focus on my own personal recovery independent of him? For example, controlling emotions during triggers on my own rather than going to him for clarification calming. It's a great question. I mean, this is a spouse is a very insightful, I think, and really saying, you know, how do I make myself feel good about myself? Because it feels really good to me when, uh, when my partner tells me that they did this or they, did. in other words, it's satisfying to get another piece of information um, or um, yeah, partners recovery and self-discovery is very helpful in my healing. Um, but are you too dependent on his input to help? Yeah. Um, I don't think those two pieces go together. Um, the fact that you've been abandoned in times of need is a different question from, um, am I too dependent or not on him? Um, you have to deal. I understand the question is, should I lean on him again? If he disappointed me like that, maybe I'll make a mistake and lean on him again and I'll get hurt again. Um, and I think what Tammy and I would say is, this is a really good time to spread your needs around. You know, uh, it's fine to lean into the people you love or trust, but now you know that um, this person is not, especially in this early stages, they're not going to be able to feed your emotional self. They probably weren't earlier, but they really have to focus on themselves right now. And if something disappointing does happen, I want you to have three people to call and a therapist to go see and a group to go to. And, you know, I want you to have the support that you need. So that when you do lean into someone, and this is true for everybody in every situation, you know, I, I absolutely want to lean into my spouse for everything that we can lean into each other for. But sometimes we just want to throw tomatoes at each other. And I need to call a friend and say, I, I, I wish I had more tomatoes. You know? <laughs> so uh, I do think it's a lot about spreading around. It isn't so much about should I depend on him or not. It's about how diverse are my, uh, is my support. So if that particular strut breaks, I'm going to be able to take care of myself. And that leads to the second part, which is, yes, if you, if you want to create all of that support, then you have to focus on your own personal recovery independent of, of him. It's sort of like this. It's like in a coupleship, you're used to, you know, the two of you being your primary source of support. And now you can't be anymore. You know, someone's too angry. Someone's too broken someone's too busy someone doesn't trust i mean you have to it's not that you don't need to lean on people in the way you did each other but now it's not you're not ready so you really have to turn outward for your support and the good news is when you do turn back together you've got all of that support so yeah i think it's very very important for you to work on your recovery but we're not talking about codependency you know i'm not i don't think it's when you say personal recovery what i think about is um, going to supportive environments, making new friends, um, self-care, um, you know, go, uh, going for a weekend away with a friend, spending more time with your, you know, whatever it is that's good for you, that is your, and grieving, you know, those belong to your personal recovery. Um, but if you're thinking about, well, do I need to work on my trauma from my past history? Because not, I mean, not at all, <laughs> not if you don't choose to. So, um, and by the way, if you're having strong emotions and being like feeling triggered, don't go to him. 
you would go to him if there was no one else to turn to. But it's almost like having a sponsor, having a support. You absolutely have a right to have someone be there for you to help you when you're triggered. Absolutely. But you guys have a long history of kind of, you know, dealing with these issues, not in the best ways. And I think turning outward again is, is your best choice. Um, no, I, I, I agree. I, I mean, I, I, when people call, I'm often saying you guys can't be each other's, you know, sole support, if, right. you know, the, the, you need more. So even taking you out of the equation, he needs support, like the opposite of addiction is healthy attachment. We need, you know, I, I was talking to somebody earlier today and I was like, our best thinking gets us in this issue. And then we suddenly think that we're going to be able to figure it all out and do it on ourselves. It doesn't work that way. I, I don't, I've been around a while. I don't know anybody that has been successful for that. So, and I'm sure somebody's going like, but I'm going to be, you know, but, but for the partners. So, you know, letting that person work on themselves and get, you know, and it's okay to say, you know, I mean, please do the check-ins like that's do those check-ins, do things that are still connecting, but you deserve to have strong emotions and not go, Oh, I, you know, I need to control these so that, you know, that I don't trigger him either. No, you mm -hmm. go vent to your betrayed partner group and go, Oh my gosh, I'm so, you know, whatever you, you deserve the emotions, you guys getting support from other people so that you can do check-ins and, you know, show up for each other on certain levels, but not the, not the deepest levels yet. There's, it's a, it's a journey. Just understand that, you know, it doesn't get fixed overnight. It didn't happen overnight. Okay. Next question. Hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm actually typing. I'm typing, and you know, I'm not the fastest typer. Oh, oh my. Okay, I think I did this right. I okay. don't know. Okay, so let's go to hello, Dr. Rob. Is depression common among addicts? Um, are symptoms different from depression with non addicts? Is medical treatment SSRIs necessary for this, or sober time will help get rid get get this get rid of? I assume this depression. Sorry, um, I was answering the last question. Um, so I don't, this is like a research question if you really want to get it underneath it. And I don't have answers to you about that. Um, what I can say is that um, a lot of us struggle with um, a lot of self-hatred, a lot of problems with self-esteem, um, the compulsive behaviors. Um, some of us, uh, you know, it, it, let me go back and say this. I think it's always important and helpful to get um, some kind of evaluation. You know, I struggled for years um, with my recovery. I got sober. I used to think, oh, I feel so terrible about myself because I'm acting out. That was partially true, but I was also really, really depressed and uh, I couldn't really figure that one out. Um, so I will say about half of the clients that I have seen over the years have been on, you know, an SSRI or an SNRI. Um, and if you want to figure out what those are, feel free to look them up on Google, SSRI and SNRI. Um, uh, some people who struggle, I mean, there, there is no general answer I can give you. Some people who struggle with compulsive behavior and aren't particularly depressed will benefit from one of these drugs and they feel less compulsive and less obsessive. Other people lose interest in sex altogether. You know, it really, um, so I would say about half of us have depression. That's a lot more common than the general population. So yeah, a lot of us struggle with depression, but also anxiety and OCD and ADD and, you know, we have a brain problem, trust me. Um, our brain doesn't work right or we wouldn't be sitting here. So, um, you know, if there are ways that we can make our brain and functioning improve with a really good, competent addiction, knowledgeable psychiatrist, I'm all in. Um, um, by the way, if I had depressed, I wouldn't wait for more sober time to think I wasn't going, I was going to be less depressed. Um, just achieving sobriety is a, mm -hmm. a reason to go celebrate. If you are unable to feel good, don't think like, well, I have to be mm -hmm. sober for 37 days in order to get, you know, depression mm -hmm. is depression, mm -hmm. but you don't have to make your own decisions about this. There are experts who can talk to you and really, you know, a good psychiatrist, um, really worth their weight in gold will change your life. That um, understands if, addiction because not all of them do. Right. 
but Tammy knows people who do, and we can often make a referral or find well, someone for or you. Or if you're working with a CSAT certified sex addiction uh, therapist, uh, trained therapist, they typically have someone they know that it can recommend. So if you've got local connections already, great, you know, lean into lean into those. So um, so it's complicated, mm. but there's no one general answer. Okay, next question. SAPA here. At what point in your journeys did you start to see major changes in your attitudes towards addiction? I understand it's an ever transitioning process, but was there ever a day that you realized your mm -hmm. bottom line actions were not nearly as controlling as before? When you say actions, um, oh, I see the desire to act out. Yeah, I mean, I can absolutely, but it was over time, like, and it goes back and forth. I think in sex addiction, like some, you know, I think it's like a roll forward and then take a pause and then roll forward some more and i think it's because this is pretty psychological challenges and so it it goes in 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 um it, it isn't an even process but i will say that i can remember looking up and remembering that it wasn't controlling my life anymore and that i you know i liked looking at people i thought they were attractive i appreciated what was inside of me but but i could choose to not do that and there was so much time when i I saw someone's like, oh, I'm going to go do that or um, something. Oh, I can do. I mean, it would never even, even when I tried really, really hard. Um, so, um, but it, I'll say this. I never left meetings. I never left therapy. I knew how sick I was. You know, I knew how troubled I was. I still am, but I understand it. I know how to work with it. You know, uh, the trauma is something I look at. It doesn't control me. So it's, you know, I don't think any of this goes away, not the addiction, not the craziness, not, but we can learn to know ourselves better to work with ourselves more effectively. And then you realize, you know, I'm still crazy. I say things to Tammy. I'm like, did I really say that to you? But now I know it wasn't a good thing to say. And I can come back and say, I'm so sorry, you know, or whatever. I didn't even know that before. I never even would have done that before. Do I not Oh, do I still sometimes say, say things that aren't the right th thing to say? Absolutely. But I recognize them. I clean them up. You know, these are the things of, of healing, I think, is to learning how to live your life with your deficits. Um, I'll tell you one more thing. I learned one of the big keys to me sobriety um, and healing was um, when I realized that I was never going to get what I didn't get that you know that for many years i've been walking around kind of like a, i see myself with like a little bowl looking for someone to fill it up for me you know will you help me feel loved will you love on me will you you know and, and it kind of was a sieve like all stuff would just fall through it but you know i was waiting for that situation or that person to come along who was going to fill this up or you know fill this up and when I finally realized that no one was ever going to come along to do that, that I was always going to have to live with what I didn't get back then, and that no one today and no behavior today was going to um, make it better, I had to learn to live with it. And I had to learn that the pain was mine. It wasn't something that others did to me. That took a, a lot of time to get to the point where I could accept that I was running around like a little kid wanting to be loved. And then to acknowledge I still needed the love, but the way I was going about it was the illness. I mean, it's just, it takes time. Um, and there are days, by the way, I really want to hear this and I'll be quiet. Um, I was walking, I went, I've been walking now and I saw a really attractive person because it's very warm and lovely here in Santa Monica. And I thought to myself, can I have sex with that person right now in like, and still be home in time for the, this meeting, you know? you know, it, it doesn't go away, go away. And part of it is just being human, but I've learned to say, Oh, you know, isn't it interesting? I had that feeling and God, and I, what I do now, God bless them. Aren't they beautiful? Those young people, and I just keep going, you know, cause I've learned to live with it. Anyway, Tam, I've gone on and on, but you nodded no, your head. So I thought, no, yeah, I did a lot. And you know, the, the, the fleeting. So, so yeah, there, there were so many, all I kept thinking was layers. Like there'd be so many layers and I'd go, oh, this is so much better. And then I'd get another layer and I'd go, oh, this is even better. And it isn't like, you know, it's just all magic and there wasn't, you know, bumps along the way, but, but, you know, I've had, and I still experience that, you know, I appreciate the things that I continue to learn um, so that, you know, I can look back. I always use a two-year mark. I don't know why, but um, like right now I can look back at two years ago and gosh, I'm in a better place and I do 
more things in a way that, you know, that I, that I'm happy about um, congruency and all of that. Um, and I'm still willing to do the work so that two years from now I can do the same thing. And that for a while was a challenge for me because I wanted to get it all wrapped up with a pretty bow and go, yes. And that didn't happen. Mm. Just doesn't. So like, you know, Dr. Rob was talking about, I had a few years ago, open the fridge and there was a, there was an open beer. My husband was making a something he cooks. I don't. And he, so he's making some sauce and there's a, a, an open glass of beer in the fridge. First thought, I didn't know it was there. First thought was I could drink that and nobody would know. And, and, and then the next thought was just laughing like crazy. Cause I was like, and then I go tell my husband, cause I have to come clean. And I was like, you aren't going to believe this. And then he's freaking out. And I was like, no, no, no. I'm just sharing with you. Cause I have to put it out there. So, and that's for me, for my recovery for that. It's, you know, so, so, but, but it was so funny to have that fleeting thought, but like Dr. Rob was sharing, it's like, it's a fleeting thought. You own it. And, you know, and, and I move on and, you know, I didn't relapse or any of that type of thing. So, um, so appreciate the journey, look at the, look at the, you know, the markers along the way and go, gosh, I'm making progress. You know, uh, um, my attitude, I was an early ascriber to the, I'm grateful to be a recovering addict because I was a hot mess with no plan to be able to live as a contributing member of society. I didn't know how. And so for someone to go, you're an addict and we can help you. I believe them and they were right. So gratitude. And I just kept, you know, I've continued the journey. I'm just going to keep listening to recovering people. So. I just want to say one more thing. And I know we're taking a lot of time with this one, but um you said, you know, was every day you realized that your bottom line actions were not as controlling before as before. And I think, um, I don't think there is a day. I think it comes and goes. And um, what I really love about what you said here and, um, is that you didn't say before you realized that your bottom line actions were going to stop. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. What you said was stop controlling my life. And I think that's a very realistic way of looking at this. Um, and I know you spouses absolutely want to hear it's going to stop. It's never going to come back. They're never going to want to do this again. But the reality is this is a great way to look at it, which is how can I grow to a place where this doesn't pull on me like it used to? Um, yeah, that was really good in there. Go ahead, Tammy. I'm sorry. Okay. Next question. How long after my SA husband is in recovery before I can begin to feel safe? He and his sponsor say he is in step three. He started therapy with a therapist to work on family of origin trauma today. Well, that's a tough one because, you know, each person is different and I don't know the degree to which, you know, I could say he's, he, I could say he's been acting out all along and continues to lie to you and has a girlfriend somewhere from what you said. Or I could say, um, wow, you know, in three weeks you can start feeling safe, but I don't have an answer to that because I don't know how honest he is or how committed he is or um what does it mean to be in a step three does he you know I, I i don't have enough information um and again i'll say to you guys again i don't know that everyone should start trauma therapy when they're in early recovery um if you don't have a a, a real foundation for the feelings and issues that are going to come up and they are when you start looking at the past then you're just going to go back to acting out so you know, people ask, well, which do I work first on? We'll really have a solid foundation of support and sobriety before you get into the trauma work. So I just say that a family of origin therapy is trauma work and it raises our anxiety and it makes us more, you know, maybe a little bit more uncomfortable and that can challenge acting out. But Tammy, I don't have a good answer for this person. Do you? I do. I do. Before okay. I can begin to feel safe. You're going to feel safe when his actions are showing you that he, you know, that he is becoming trustworthy. I cringe because I, you've been around before. So I know there's, it's a longer period of time. And I cringe when somebody's on the first three steps. Well, I just haven't really gotten the first three steps. Well, steps four through nine, that's where, you know, to me, and, and this is, I'm, I'm in step three because I'm avoiding step four and five. I don't want to have to do them because they're harder. And everybody says, oh, they're terrible. Their freedom, that, that is, 
You know, that is where we start to change. In the promises, before we are halfway through, we're working four through nine and we start to feel different. Things start to change. You know, we will not regret the past nor wish to, uh, we close the door on it. We don't have to, um, we don't have to lie and cheat and do all of those things. So, so what I am reading, because I've seen you before here, and I'm grateful you're here, is I'm hanging out in one through three and I'm just going to spin around there. And I'm going like, I would be going like, and you can't make him do anything. I would, I would encourage you not to begin to feel safe until his actions really show you that he is trustworthy. And um, uh, in steps one through three, I wouldn't feel safe yet. So that's just me. Okay. Now I really am typing and I found the right place. Okay. So you, what are you talking about? No, I won't do anything with the next one. So this is the next one is eight years ago my first big d-day my spouse went to therapy for 18 months to save our marriage was healed um our last d-day was nine months ago but now he's going through the 12-step program has finally found a sponsor goes to meetings and is now trying to save himself which i'm grateful for last week he was reading his journal to me oh broke down sobbing sadly i didn't know how to react i basically froze and didn't know how to react told him i was proud of him wrong answer i i i don't think it's a wrong answer i think you were sharing truthfully about how you, you know i mean were you proud of him for for sharing with you i mean i i don't know oh. what, what was his reaction to your saying that i don't know what are your thoughts why why did he i don't understand why he was crying i didn't get that part. He's, he was reading his journal to me broke down sobbing uh -huh. so apparently why? something very painful in his journal right he maybe that's i'm making that up but um sadly oh, I, I didn't Just know how what to react do I say um you know i think you say what's in your heart you know i i always think it's it's um it's useful to comment on how someone feels like you really look like you know you're sad or you really look like something affected you. Um, you know, I think that makes people feel seen like, oh, they get what I'm dealing with or what I'm talking about just to reflect back what you see. But, um, you know, I would say something like, you know, I'm really sorry, you're going, do you want me to, do you want to tell me what it is? Can I help in some way? Um, you, because they may have a boundary around, you know, I, re I really just want me to hold me. Um, so I don't, um, by the way, I'm glad he was never healed and your marriage never healed. So I really appreciate that you guys moved past that um, into him really doing work and all of that kind of stuff. Um, what I would say though, I'll add one more thing is that when I see someone that I care about in recovery, breaking down and crying, reading their journal, I think, woohoo, we're getting somewhere. They're getting into their stuff and I'm not even in the room, Mr. Therapist, they're getting into it on their own. And you know what, he's not looking at porn and he's not writing letters to affair partners and he isn't, you know, he's actually sitting there and working on himself. And so, and then having feelings about it. So I would be proud of him too. On the other hand, I don't know what he's writing down or dealing with. So I probably want to know more before I said I was proud of you. But that that's definitely not a wrong answer. No, and, yeah. And, and here's the deal. This, uh, I think what easily um, can happen is that gets compartmentalized and we never talk about it again. I, you know, I think it's fair to go, you know, uh, we, we had this happen last week and it so caught me off guard and you know i was i want to elaborate i told i'm proud of you for sharing that with me for willing to be vulnerable in front of me whatever is your truth i'm not you know you know whatever it is you know i i would like to check in with you and see how you're doing is there any way i can support you but you know i have a conversation about it you know open the door again let it you know like have the space to be able to have those vulnerable moments, you know, between the two of you, you know, right or wrong, you're no relationship is done perfectly. I mean, you're, you know, like, it's like, it's okay. It's like, here's where we're at. What, you know, I, I want, I want to touch base with you about what happened and how we can, you know, move forward from here. Great. That's my thought. Mm, we're, we're, yeah, we did. We both talked about that. So I think we're done. On but what? I want to finish this note I'm writing to someone. Oh, uh, okay. On the next one, the heel. The... No. Um, well, uh, what did I answer? Um, 
No you were on the essay husband, the 513 one. So what did I say? You, um, oh, I, I don't no, know. I was working on healing rocks because I thought, you know, we okay. were to this question. So I wanted to write something. Okay. I think okay. we can quickly get through it. Um, um, basically, both of these people in this couple should have mental health issues. And uh, your partner goes to, you get a lot of help, but he doesn't. Um, and he's not willing to go to therapy. So I just try to listen and provide emotional support. We're still very young, but we want to start a life together because we love each other, you know, but I have reservations about it. Um, well, how do we navigate this? And, and you know, I just really, I have strong feelings about this. I wrote a book called Pro-Dependence. There's a whole chapter about this. I did some research. Two troubled people together are going to grow more effectively and more efficiently than two single people. And so if it may well be over time that as you are supportive and you're getting your mental health treatment, that he will start to move toward getting it too. But I mean, what I was really trying to say is love is hard to find. Love is hard to find and precious when found. And it just doesn't happen that often. And so if you have love, and I really believe in the whole concept of it, because it means to me attachment. If you have someone that you can be attached to and you can deal with each other's messes and support each other's strengths, I say, you know, good for you. You found a relationship where you can both grow together. Now, if someone's abusive, you know, different issue. Um, but I don't, people are ready to find their bottom when they're ready to find their bottom. Um, meaning when he is ready to really get help for his emotional issues, he will. But I wouldn't blackmail him into doing it or not doing it. I think you should, Tammy, you're going to hate this. Follow your heart. So, um, I mean, you both have stuff. Isn't that great? Um, they can be a mess together. I love that. Yeah, you know, but and you don't have to do it perfectly. You can be a mess together, but you can, you know, you can learn and grow. And you know, gosh, I appreciate you being vulnerable. Unless I mean, you know, oh my goodness. Okay, we we are We're out done. of time. We started a We're little toast. bit late. I'm, gonna go I'm feed so the sorry. There were some that that yeah. I'm gonna go eat with my kids and grandkids. So all right, I will talk to you guys later. Thanks everybody. Thanks for week. your patience. Bye bye. Uh,